In this video, we're going to take a look at what's new in CPM3 from the programmer's perspective. And as always, we're going to run it on an Altair 8800. Let's go ahead and get the computer on, give it a hard reset, examine the bootstrap, uh, excuse me, the disk bootloader at 177400, and hit run. All right, and as we saw in previous videos, CPM3 takes a bit longer than uh, CPM2 did to boot to boot and we're also watching it go through the extra amount of time here it takes to run some startup commands in the profile.sub uh, but it's always fun to watch the blinking lights on the Altair and that's pretty much the end of the boot process there let's take a look at the screen from here on out in this video all right one of the first things you might be tempted to do is go ahead and assemble a program that you have and see how that goes under the CPM3 environment I have one out here called dump so let's go ahead and assemble that and the first thing you notice is that ASM is no longer present. The default assembler with uh, CPM is now called RMAC. Let's go ahead and get that running. RMAC is a relocating macro assembler, hence its name. Um, unlike ASM, whose output was an absolute file in Intel hex format, RMAC has an output um, as a relocatable object file, a .rel file. And of course, as indicated by the name, it also supports macros. Uh, the format of the relocatable object file, interestingly enough, is not their own format. They chose to go ahead and just adopt Microsoft's format for object files as used with all their languages. So by this point in time, Microsoft had already established enough a name for itself that even the largest operating system company today, Digital Research, adopted their standard for relocatable object files for languages. Um, and of course, though, at, at 1983, when CPM3 came out, uh, and Microsoft was already starting to take over the uh, operating system world as well. All right, so that assembly is done. The next thing you do is go ahead and load it to convert the object file into an executable.com file. And as you might expect, load doesn't work anymore either. That's Its job was to take a .hex file, Intel hex, convert it to a .com. For this, there is, as you'd expect, a linker. It's called link. Link is a full-fledged, full-featured, linking loader. It can combine multiple object files, not just the one that you see here, into a .com file. It can combine code segments and data segments and common segments um, together as well from multiple sources, resolve uh, references in libraries, all the things the link getter would typically do. And at this point we now have our .com file and we can run dump. Let's just dump ourselves. And you can see the program runs. Um, very little change need needed to your source files to run under RMAC, things you'd done in ASM. Um, maybe change one line to you know add a CSEG for code segment directive, that kind of thing. But for the most part, it was very easy to jump from ASM to RMAC. Now in doing this, um, digital research didn't really leapfrog the competition or anything. By finally going to more professional tools with relocating assemblers and linkers, digital research really just caught up with what everybody else, including Microsoft, had been doing for years. Even hardware vendors would supply some of their own tools because ASM was kind of, uh, you know, primitive in terms of its capability. Although there was a lot of programs written in ASM. All right, now one new feature that was provided um, with the new linker, something that the others didn't, and that's because it's a CPM3 specific feature, was the ability to generate what's called a page relocatable output file. It has nothing to do with a relocatable object file. This is actually the .com, the executable file. Um, it was a system to make it relocatable at runtime. And that was done by using a bitmap that marked every single byte that had to be updated in order to run at a different address. Because 8080 code cannot be written position independent, at least not easily. Um, and so all your calls, all your jumps, anywhere where you loaded an address into a register, all those had to be changed if a program was to be run at a different address than it was originally assembled to run at. Um, even in CPM2 days, there's reasons to be able to do this. For example, the debugger, DDT, um, it would get loaded into RAM at 100 hex, just like any other program. However, it then needed to immediately relocate itself up into high memory, up under the BDOS, wherever that happened to be on the machine it was running on, so that it could make room to load the program you were going to debug down at 100. So it had to be relocated at runtime. Uh, Move CPM did that as well. That was the program that allowed you to take an executable version of CPM and say, here's your new top of memory. So you 
it would run a different location in a 64K system than it would in a 56K system. And so it had to relocate CPM as well. So that feature was done even prior to CPM3, but it was a manual effort. That bitmap had to be created typically by assembling a program at two different addresses and comparing the two output files. Anywhere they differed it had to be because of an address difference. Um, and then to use that file was just part of the program, would access that bitmap file and turn around and figure out how to relocate itself. What's new in CPM3 is that is now just a standard definition in the operating system. The linker produces um, an output file that contains the bitmap and contains the information that, hey, this is a relocatable .com file um, just as part of the link operation. So it's very simple to do now. And the CCP, which is handling our A prompts and loading programs, recognizes that type of file and actually does the relocation for you. And of course, there's still a debugger. DDT is still there. Well, actually, it's been replaced with SID, SID, Symbolic Interactive Debugger. Very similar debugger, just it, it handles the symbols that are provided by the linker. Um, that still needs relocating, but the main reason it was done was before it was for a whole new class of programs called Resident System Extensions, .rsx. As the name implies, this is a program that stays resident in memory and provides extended system functions. So whenever you ran one of these, it would get loaded up into high memory under the BDOS under any other RSXs that happen to already be loaded um, by the, the CCP when you type it here on the command line. And so that's what we're going to take a look at next is this powerful new feature called the RSX. We're going to do a video cut and we'll start in and look at how one of those programs went together. When a program wants to make any call to the operating system, it does it by jumping through a vector down on page zero in RAM. And that vector normally points to the BDOS. However, when an RSX is loaded in RAM, that vector points to the most recently loaded RSX. That means the RSX gets to inspect all operating system calls, and if it wants to, intercept that call and process it in its own way. Um, and of course, if it wants to do that, it can do it. Otherwise, it just passes that call on to the next RSX that is in memory through a link list that is maintained by the CCP. At the end of that link list, uh, the final RSX points to the BDOS. So if no RSX intercepts that call, the BDOS executes it as normal. Now, all your RSXs get loaded up into high memory under the BDOS or under any other RSXs that are loaded. And that is why the page relocatable format generated by the linker is so important, is because all these RSXs have to be moved to a different address in RAM in order to run. All right, so we've got a demo version that I wrote so we can see how an RS wor RSX works. It's called lock. What lock does is disable the console. Of course, there's a lot of ways to do this, but if you look here, you can see that anything I type, it just does, it just does nothing. And I can even do a control C to reboot and it still does nothing. But if I type in a password, that is the password for the demo, it re-enables the console and now it works. Now this was done uh, using an RSX as opposed to you know, having the program fake all that. So let's take a look and see how that is done. So first of all, we'll take a look at the program I ran and it was called lock. This is an actual program that gets loaded and runs down at hex 100. And if you take a look, all it does is load the message, console disable, write it out, and then exit. That is all the program does. But what's actually doing the work is the RSX itself. So let's take a look at that. And that's locked with an R at the end. That's just how I named it. All right, and at the beginning of an RSX is this prefix that we see here. The first six bytes are where the CCP can put the serial number from CPM, and then there's a jump into the RSX. This matches exactly what the BDOS looks like in the first six bytes, followed by the next three bytes. So any programs that want to verify a signature in RAM, so it looks like a BDOS, this will make your RSXs look like a BDOS since they are pointed to by the jump vector. All right, so the first thing that really matters is this address here. This is the jump to where the RSX is going to test to see if it wants to intercept this function. Here we see the link list that the CCP maintains. RSX next is a jump 
to the address of the next RSX in the chain and the CCP fills that in. And here's a pointer to the previous one so that you can be removed and the, and the linked list can be maintained. One more important thing is this flag. When this flag is set to FF, then whenever the CCP does a warm boot, which is pretty much any time a program exits, um, if it's FF, then the RSX will be removed from the link list and then eventually removed from memory it can, but essentially it immediately disables that RSX. All right, so let's go down and take a look at how this program works. Basically, it takes a look at the command given to the BDOS, um, and if it's a read line, in this case, that's the command used by the CCP, for example, to read a line of code from the, I mean, a command from the operator. Um, if it's not a read line, it just jumps to the next RSX in line. It doesn't want to do anything with it, it just passes it on. But if it is the read line command, we go ahead and we've, shit, we've uh, switched to a local stack here. And what we do is simply just call the BDOS with the read line request. Now again, to play neatly, we don't call a BDOS directly, we just call the next RSX in line in case something else loaded wanted to fiddle with reline as well. But in the end, we've called the BDOS reline routine and it's come back at this point. We then compare to see if what was typed in matches the password that we've established for this. And if it is, then we unlock. If it's not, what we do is just simply return an empty string in the read line command. So whoever requested the read line is basically gonna see nothing at all but, but a carriage return. So when we watched this earlier, CPM was just seeing carriage return every time. It did not see anything that was actually typed. All right, if the correct password is provided, then a string saying, hey, we're enabled again is sent out. And then here we set that flag to FF and then do a warm boot of the CCP. That warm boot causes the CCP to go through all of the RSXs and remove any of them that have the flag set. Ours is set, so at that point this RSX is disabled and everything's up and running again. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at how you would make this. First of all, you would assemble um, the little program that does nothing but say, hey, I'm here, I'm enabled. And this is just a normal .com file, so we'll go ahead and link it. Just like you would with a normal program. Now this is going to erase the lock.com that you saw earlier and right now this lock.com is nothing but that program that printed this string. That's all it did if you remember. So you see now we haven't really shut down CPM at all. It's all working just fine because that program did nothing but type that message. All right, so now let's assemble the RSX and I don't have a lot of disk space so I'm going to that dollar sign PZ means to take the printer listing, the PRN listing, and um, just discard it. So that'll save some disk space. All right, so this is the RSX itself. And now this one, we need to link, but not generate the standard uh, .com file. Instead, we want it to generate the page relocatable format. That's what the OP for is for. The, the output is page relocatable. All right, so that generated a PRL file that you see here. All right, so now we have a, a .com file and we have this PRL file. Typically, when you start an RSX, you combine the two of those into a single executable. The .com program typically just initializes things, tells the operator what's happening, and then exits. But since the PRL file is in there, the RSX, that gets loaded into RAM and is then left there. So they're both stuck in a single file, although you don't have to have a .com along with the RSX. The utility that combines those two is called GenCom, um, but it wants the RSX file to be called something.rsx. So we have to rename uh, the PRL file to be an RSX. So let's go ahead and do that. So all we did is change the name, and now we can run GenCom, and you give it the name of a normal program that you want to put in there, which was the lock.com, and the name of the RSX. So what it does is combine these two. And what the CCP does is it sees, hey, I've got a normal executable file and I've got an RSX file in here. So it loads the RSX up into high memory underneath all the others or under the BDOS. Then it loads the actual program down at 100 like all programs. And then it jumps to that program which executes. And as you see here, 
The program ran, executed, and exited, but it put the RSX up in high memory. So now we have everything disabled like we talked about before. And that will unlock it. All right, now let's briefly show you how you can actually create an RSX that doesn't have a .com at all. So if I were to take um, GenCom and just do the RSX alone, and you have to specify the null option to say that there is no .com file. This is going to create locker.com, which again is a perfectly legitimate RSX file, but there is no .com at all. So the little string that said console disabled, enter password to re-enable, that will never run because there is no .com in it. So now if we run locker, it loaded the RSX up into high memory. The RSX is running now, so nothing, nothing works, just like we expect and the password still exits and now we're up and running again. All right, so very powerful new feature in CPM3, all sorts of system extensions and neat features can be done with that. And there are a number of features in CPM3 that rely on that, such as the get and the put redirection that we saw in the last video, um, saving memory images, there's a few useful utilities. All right, well that does it for this video. In the next video, we're gonna go ahead and um, dig a little bit deeper and do a few more things related to the programming environment. But before we leave, the computer you used for today's video was actually an Altair 8800 clone computer. This computer accurately duplicates the look, the feel, the features, and the performance of a real Altair, but it does it with modern hardware on the inside. So you don't have to worry about damaging a vintage computer while you run through all these cool exercises from the old days. So this is a great way to relive the old days and see um, how all this stuff worked. Make sure to visit AltairClone.com to learn more about this computer.